Okay, I see people joining in. That's fantastic. I imagine it's just going to take a few minutes for everyone to come in. But I'm going to get started with some housekeeping things as everyone's coming online. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. This is the second webinar in our winter webinar series, um, 2022 Pollinator Meadow Monitoring Results. Um, so I'm sure many of you are already familiar with uh, Zoom, um, but just in case you're having any issues, uh, particularly with audio, if you just check in the menu bar, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Be sure that your headphones or your speakers, whatever you're using, are set to Zoom. We will be using the question and answer feature also at the bottom of your screen today, and we'll be answering questions at the end of our presentation today. If you have questions throughout, please be sure to include them so you don't lose them from the top of your mind, but we will answer them uh, at the end. We're also going to use a chat function today. Uh, if you have any technical issues, you can send us a message to the host that way, um, but we're also going to introduce ourselves there as well. I see we have a number of people online. Okay, so we'll, let's, we'll start with some introductions. So my name is Victoria. I'm a habitat manager here at the um, Canadian Wildlife Federation, and I manage our uh, rights of way program, which we'll be talking more about in just a minute. Um, so when I say rights of way managers, I'm referring to those who um, have uh, performed vegetation management practices on hydro corridors, on roadsides, um, maybe railway or solar wind farms. So Maybe you can see some of those things in this um, uh, graphic depiction here. And today for this webinar, it's really nice because I think we have a lot of people coming with various backgrounds and experiences. I think we have rights away managers. I think we have some land managers, maybe on private lands, maybe some conservation authorities, and also some community members too, who are just really passionate um, about having improved vegetation management practices and support of pollinators. So to start, like I said, I'm Victoria. I'm based in Ottawa, where our head office is. We are on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabek Algonquin Nation. Um, so in the chat, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. You can share where you're joining from as well. If you know the um, traditional land you're joining from, that's great. And I'm also going to share share a poll. So just give me a second here to find that option. And okay, launch poll. There we go. So you should see this. And you can click um, the option in which you uh, identify with and why you're joining today. So are you a community member? Are you rights of way manager, uh, an other type of land manager, um, or other? Maybe if it's other, include that in the chat as well. And um, you can also write why you're joining us today. Um, I think we're all here with a, a general under or a general um, commitment uh, to improving uh, habitat for pollinators, but maybe there is a specific reason or something that you're looking to learn. So I'm just going to open the chat to see uh, if these are coming in. Hopefully, the chat function is working. Okay, we have someone from uh, Catherine from Essex region, uh, Lauren from Six Nations, that's fantastic. So feel free to, to introduce yourself and um, I see the poll results coming through. Are you able, I'm not sure if people are able to see the poll results here, but it looks like we have a mix of rights of way managers, community members, land managers, and quite a few other too. So I'm curious to what those are. I just read someone is working on um, Prairie Meadow Project in Trenton. Fantastic. Oh, we have people coming from all over, lots in Eastern Ontario and some um, across Canada, someone from Alberta. Uh, fantastic. Okay, that's great. So I'm going to end the poll. Let's see. Okay. All right, so like I said, um, this, this webinar is part of our Rights of Way as Habitat program. We are working collaboratively with land managers to restore the breeding and migratory habitat for monarch, um, as well as all other pollinators um, along Rights of Way. And in this project, we do that in a multitude of ways uh, with this fantastic here, uh, team here. And um, just a 
we have Tracy here who will be presenting more formally in just a minute. Um, but we have a national network of rights of way managers. This is our rights of way as habitat working group. This is a Canadian uh, network of rights of way managers. And through this network, we are able to offer um, opportunities for learning and peer to peer networking like this webinar today, as well as an annual workshop. We also have two regional networks, which we're working in Eastern Ontario and in Southwestern Ontario. And we're able to offer on the ground experiences in person like uh, roadside restoration training and tours. And we also um, do active and passive restoration with partners in these areas as well. Um, so we have another webinar that is taking place next month for rights of way managers, and this is with the Texas Department of Transportation on their wildflower program. They have been um, using vegetation management practices in support of pollinators since the 1930s. So they have many, many decades of experience um, on best management practices that we can learn from. So I will in a moment put a link in the chat. Um, for you to register. I'll also put a link in the chat uh, for our email so you can contact us if you have any questions about um, that maybe if we don't get to answer all the questions today about this um, project or about uh, the, the presentation that Tracy will be sharing with us today. We'll be recording this session uh, and it will be available on our YouTube page, our web page, and I will also send an email with the recording as well. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm really uh, excited to introduce my colleague today, Tracy Atwell, and Tracy is a restoration ecologist uh, at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. She works for um, on our rights of way project, but also our grasslands project, um, and she has a master's of science in fire ecology and a postgraduate certificate in ecological restoration, and she has extensive experience in inventorying and planning and restoring terrestrial, riparian, and wetland habitats in Canada. So I'll pass things over to Tracy to share more about our monitoring results from um, last year today. So bear with me while we uh, we transfer screens here. So I think I've stopped staring or sharing there, Tracy. Great. Okay. Just pull up PowerPoint. Is that all good? We can see your notes at the moment, Tracy. Okay. Let's switch that up. How about now? Uh, still there. Okay. Might just have to share or uh, change, swap the, swap, swatch, oh my gosh, swap the screens. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Uh, it is still there. Okay. I am going to. And it's nice to see we still have people introducing themselves. That's fantastic. I see some some familiar faces. Well, not faces. I wish I could see your faces. Some familiar names who are with us today. Oh, and it looks like we even have some some friends from across the border as well. Hello, Shannon from New York. That's fantastic. Welcome. Welcome to our webinar. There we go. That looks good for us. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, good day, everybody. I'm glad you could all join us. Uh, as Victoria said, I'm the restoration ecologist on the Rights of Way team. And what I'm going to present to you is the results of our year two of this monitoring project that we have. It's a three year project uh, in eastern Ontario. So this one is primarily focused on roadsides. Um, so without further ado, this is sort of the outline of some of the things we're going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about rights of way in a general sense, talk about the monitoring protocol that we did. We're going to talk about the scorecard tool which is how we evaluate the, the sites. We're going to talk about some of the habitat quality of these places, the nectar, the milkweed, also the weeds, a very important aspect of this, and a little bit of a sneak peek at some of the pollinator results. And then we'll talk about our next steps, and then we'll open it up to questions. So a general introduction about rights of way is that um, rights of way, when we talk about that, we're talking about roadsides, solar sites, power generating sites, places where 
there has to be active management already, mostly ter in terms of shrubs and trees uh, for safety issues or for functional issues like in a solar situation um, or in a power such situation, they have to maintain shrubs and trees so they don't interfere with the power lines. So if there's already active management going on, these are really great places for meadows. And meadows are composed of mostly flowers and grasses. So it's a real great win-win kind of fit for these places. Tracy, do you mind just moving your microphone up a little so we can hear you a little better? Is that better? Yes, that's better. Thank great. you. So just in a general sense, talking about some of the ecological services that these meadows can provide, it's great for pollinators. Pollinators are looking for that nectar, they're looking for pollen, they're looking for grass. So these are great places to support our pollinators. So we get all the pollination services of all the native pollinators, including our European honeybee and all kinds of native bees. Uh, these sites can help with floodwaters, slowing down the flow, reducing erosion, and then they also can act as natural snow fences in, in some of the places where we get more snow. Uh, it helps slow down that blow across roads. And then there's also carbon. So we know that these meadows really sequester carbon because they're perennial. So they stay for, for long periods of time, they'll put down roots and they add that carbon back into the soil. And we also think that these sites that are along roadsides can result in lower maintenance because there's less mowing, less spraying that has to happen. So that's really good from an economic perspective for municipalities doing this work. And to look more specifically at habitat benefits. So I already mentioned a lot of nectar and pollen is provided in these meadows. Uh, in terms of pollinators, there's lots of generalists, there's lots of specialists. So we want to have a variety of different plants in these areas to provide for all the different variety of pollinators that might be found in them. They also provide sites for egg laying. So some species lay their eggs in bare soil and make nests underground, and some will nest in dead stalks. So both of those are provided in this habitat. Also, they're gonna be hiding from predators, from wind, from rain, uh, any kind of uh, weather events that are happening. Some species will overwinter. So again, like underground or in the stalks, um, and then there's also lots of resources for the species that migrate. So if we talk about the monarch butterfly, it also needs lots of nectar and pollen and can find it in these meadows. Uh, and then I just wanted to point out the picture on the left of the bumblebee nest, which to me is fascinating. This is like what they look like underground where they've laid all their eggs. And most people would never see that or never know it was even there. So what the focus of this project is on roadside management. So in many places, the status quo is to do what's called boom spraying and mowing. So boom spraying is when they go through with a big arm and they apply a herbicide along the, right, or along the sides of the roads within a certain distance. And the attempt here is to control for weeds. Usually what's on the Weed Control Act is what they're concerned about. Um, other places are doing a more of a light intensity approach, like we'll talk about with Lanark County today. And when we say light intensity, we're talking about where there might be spot spring, individual plants, or individual plants are being removed in a patchy kind of distribution where there's light weed pressure. So the other thing we're looking at here too is hydro seeding. So a lot of places where construction is happening, road widening, any kind of maintenance, ditching, they do need to go back and put vegetation back in. So what we're looking at here is if a native seed could be used when they're going back in, which is a little bit more costly, but would have more benefits for the pollinator over long term. So what we did for this last year, we looked at some rural roads in the city of Ottawa, Lanark County, and Leeds and Granville counties. And so each of them is doing something slightly different. So some are being boom sprayed, which is Leeds and Granville and the city of Ottawa. And then some are doing hydro seeding like in Lanark. And then Lanark, as I mentioned, is also doing hand pulling spot spraying. So we wanted to compare these different treatments and see what gives the best for pollinator quality. So in terms of specifics, what the weed cover would be, what the milkweed stems are, what the nectar resources are in these different treatment types. 
So what we did is we sampled 25 sites. So some were boom sprayed, some were low intensity, and some were hydro seeded sites. I think I already mentioned the three different areas. So we went out and did this in late June, mid July, and late August and September. So the reason we did this was to try to capture the three different parts of the season. So you have different flowers coming up at different points, and that's going to provide a variety of different uh, resources. And also the pollinators are going to vary over that season because the food resources will need to match up with the life cycle. So some might nest early, some might nest late. So we're trying to get a full picture of that. Uh, so we had these plots that were 70 meters by two meters. And this was based on the pollinator scorecard protocol, which I'm going to show you. And we also had our uh, fabulous entomologist uh, go out and sample the same sites because we also wanted to get a good idea of what actual pollinator species would be found in these different locations. So here's page one of the pollinator scorecard. So I'm not trying to, I know they're fine print there and you probably can't read everything, but it's to give you a sense of how the scorecard is, uh, is used. So when you would go to your site, you would look at for each of these different uh, boxes. So you would look sort of at the, the first one on the left, potentially flowering. You'd figure out, is it 1%, is it 6%? And these are all categories. So you'd have to figure out where your percentage is. So if I had 15% flowering native cover, nectar cover, I'd give it a score of 12. If I go down number of nectar plant species, if I have five, then I would give it a three number of native nectar species. So that's a very particular group of plants. If I had one to five, then I would give it a one. And then you add all these up at the end and that gives you your score. And also to point out the additional habitat resources at the top there, these are things that we know are good for pollinators outside of uh, the plants themselves or the flowers themselves. So things like brush piles are good places for pollinators to hide, to nest. Um, that bare ground that I mentioned, that's important too. Uh, plants with the hollow stems is places where they can lay their eggs. And just also to mention this, this is, you can see at the top tier three. So there's three levels to this uh, product protocol. Level three is meant for people who have an uh, ability to identify native plants. Um, so that's not always the case. So there is a tier one for people who want something more simplified where they can still gather a, a score. And it's meant for rights of way managers. So they might be an organization that has only one time in the whole season that they have to go out and send out someone to do monitoring. So it's meant to be very quick as well. So going back to the slide here, so you can see the page two of four. So um, we see the milkweed, abundance of milkweed. So we know that milkweed is the host plant of the monarch butterfly, which why it's very important to know when it, how much milkweed you have. So um, obviously it scales up as the more stems that you have. Um, and that gives us a gauge of how much habitat is for a monarch on the site. And then the one box to the right is the invasive species and noxious weed cover. So the more weed cover you have, the lower your score is which kind of makes sense. You'd prefer to have sites with lower weed cover. So you go through all these steps, you add up all the points, you get your total points, and then you can see the gray box where you can figure out where your score lands you for your site. Is it a site that needs improvement? Is it a basic site? Is it moderate habitat? Is it high habitat? Or is it exemplary? This is just to highlight that again. So we're very interested in knowing what the different quality ratings are and how we can compare sites across the landscape. Um, even in the United States, we're connected with the US Rights of Way Habitat Working Group, which is where the scorecard comes from. And the idea is that we would eventually be able to compare some of our sites to theirs based on these uh, quality ratings. So I'm also showing you a little photo there on the right of um, a site that was boom sprayed in July. Uh, it does have some flowers in it, but um, just to make the point that microsites can really vary for the plant community across the landscape. So there's just some general observations. In this part of the world, we only saw common milkweed. We, we didn't see two other species of milkweed, which we could have found in this area, which is swamp or butterfly milkweed. 
So we're kind of curious about that. Would like to see if there's a way to increase the biodiversity by um, seeding. We'll get to that later. And then it was interesting that the milkweed occurrence we did see was random. We either had none at a site, a little, or a whole bunch of milkweed. Uh, often the hydro seeding sites had really high number of milkweed. So it seemed like hydro seeding was a really great way to get lots of milkweed on the landscape. And looking at the scores, I told you we did three, three times. So the July ones were the highest scores. And I think that's because we're seeing the richest diversity of plants in this part of the world in July. Might be different in other places, but uh, looking at those numbers specifically here is a, an accurate, more accurate potential of what the full score could be. But at the same time, in August, for example, the scorecard goes way down, but that's because you have fewer diversity of plants across the board, but you primarily have asters and goldenrods. But it's kind of a misleading thing to give it a lower score because in our part of the world, those that time period is really a boon for a lot of pollinators, especially the monarchs. They need to fatten up and gather nectar and pollen before they fly back to Mexico. When they get to Mexico, they don't eat for months. So this is really key time for them to, to um, fatten up for the winter. And also the asters and goldenrods, like those are really important as well for all kinds of species. So we had very few habitat quality, high habitat quality sites. So we had one that was a hydro seeded and two that were uh, low intensity and nothing that came up exemplary, something that would be 75 or higher. Um, I mean, this is early days, but we're still trying to wrap our heads around if there is a way that you could boost the quality of a site, what could actions could you take after to make it higher? So, and also is exemplary even realistic? Is that something that we could ever hope to achieve with a, a little bit of effort, a lot of, it, a lot of effort? Uh, that's one of the questions we still have yet to answer. So to show you some of this data, uh, this graphing, um, so we have the number of plots on the left-hand side in each of the categories for hydro seeding, low intensity, and boom spraying. Um, so you have uh, zero native nectar plants, one to five, six to 10, and 11 to 20. So just looking at the, the scores, you can see, we want the, to, the trend to go in the direction of the arrow. So the more that we have on the higher side, the better it is for the pollinators. So we can see that the boom spring is there at zero and one to five, and then it sort of drops off. And we still have a few that are in the six to 10. And this is kind of what we would expect because we're, when we do the low intensity and the hydro seeding, it is focused more on native plants. But I just wanted to add that um, there is a bit of a skewing of data here because we only have five hydro seeding pl plots and 15 of low intensity and 10 of boom spring. So there could be a, a variable in there too where we, we don't have an even number across the board. So this one is to show you milkweed categories. So again, um, across the bottom, we have categories. So if you had no, no milkweed, you had one or you had 50 plus. So, and then the left-hand side is the actual frequency or number in each of those categories. So again, the arrow is showing you the direction that we wanna see more milkweed on the landscape is obviously better for monarchs and for other species. And so you can see that at the end, we still do have the milkweed in the boom sprayed uh, and the hydro seed and, and the low intensity. Um, obviously low intensity across the board has you know the most milkweed. Um, and I think this is because at least in this part of the world, the chemical that they're using is called Clearview and it doesn't actually kill milkweed. So it kind of stunts it and sets it back, but doesn't um, kill it completely. Um, but just because there is milkweed in a plot doesn't necessarily mean it's good quality for monarchs. And in fact, there was a paper that just came out this week and it talked about how they could, they did observe that the monarchs were able to detect the quality of the milkweed and they would avoid laying eggs on the ones that were more stunted or um, damaged in some way. So next is weeds. So uh, this is the same. So you're seeing the uh, frequency or number of plots, roadside plots in each of these different categories. Um, and as you go to the right where the arrow is, that means it's got a heavier weed pressure. 
And we obviously don't want to have weeds, we want to have less. But what's interesting about this is that um, it's counterintuitive, because you would think that with the boom sprayed sites that are being sprayed actively for weeds, that they would have lower weed, weed cover. And actually, we're not seeing that at all. We're seeing that um, there's still a lot of weeds in these sites. So we think that what's happening is the native species are suppressing the, some of those weeds. Um, and you know, the biggest weed here in this part of the world is well parsnip. Uh, so sometimes the spray hits it, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you're left with a tiny little seedling that can come back. Uh, there's lots of seed in the soil. So it's kind of like an ongoing problem in terms of weed control. So some general points, what affects the site quality? We talked about weed control a bit. Um, in seeding as a top up, particularly milkweed is something we think would be good, especially in low intensity sites where you might have bare soils and less weed pressure. Uh, a goal might be to have 4% of milkweed seed in all of your mixes to make sure it's distributed uh, evenly in the community. And it does like to grow with other native species. And um, I think also mentioned about the fall flowers. So those are still important, even though the scorecard downgrades them. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that those are important plants. And also, as I mentioned, the milkweed presence doesn't necessarily mean it's good for habitat. The quality of that milkweed is also important. So in summary, uh, some site and conditions do influence the overall quality score. Uh, things like nutrients, uh, light, uh, shading, those things are all important too. So we did see that the hydro seeded sites and low intensity sites are very comparable in terms of what they offer for pollinators. We did see a higher weed score on the boom spread sites. Uh, the boom spread sites can provide milkweed, not necessarily good. Uh, and the hydro seeding surprisingly can also provide good milkweed and nectar cover. And also to mention that um, some of our pollinators we're noticing are still using non-native species as well, like things like clover and um, even um, wild parsnip or um, viper's bug gloss is another one they quite love. So we're still trying to figure out how would we address those things. Obviously anything that's invasive can't remain, but is there a place for some of these other non-natives that might be less problematic? And then uh, I wanted to show you a few sneak peek slides of some of the pollinator uh, information. So we're still getting in and digging through the analysis of all these this uh, pollinator data that um, Jill Miranda had collected for us. But I wanted to show you some interesting uh, slides that um, we're looking at some of the, the unusual or common, some of the general trends that we were seeing. So I'm not entomologist, so I'm gonna attempt the Latin, but uh, so for the B group, we saw Hylaeus, which was mostly restricted to the low intensity sites. And they're using these hollow stems as nesting sites. Uh, uncommon taxa that we found mostly in the hydro seeded and low intensity sites. So Bombus citrinus, Nomada, Sphecodes, uh, and these ones are interesting because they're social parasites. So they depend on other paras other species to live out their life cycle. So if the host isn't there, then they're not going to survive or be found in these areas. So that also tells us there's like the trophic level of different uh, species relying on each other. So that's a good sign as well. And to look at flower flies, uh, bees get lots of love, but people don't really know about flower flies and don't value them the same. But they are a good, good um, component of the pollinator community. So we did see uh, these platycheris, which is a genus, so a group of species, and most of those were found on the low intensity sites. Uh, another species here, Chalosurfus nemorus was associated with the moist forest and wetlands. So we, we did have some low intensity sites that had a little bit more moisture, were a little more shaded. And so the, these uh, guys seem to really like that habitat. So more flower flies, some uncommon species that we found only in the low intensity sites, Paragus angustifrons and Halophilus latifrons. So some two photos there. So generally speaking, we're seeing that the low intensity and hydro seeding sites are attracting more uncommon and specialist species than boom spring. And in an ideal world, we wanna be able to provide a variety of habitats so we can support 
the specialists and the generalists of all these communities. And here a little stat. So we've, we're looking at a lot of the different uh, associations and correlations. Um, this is one that came up early on that's uh, come out as significant. So the flower fly diversity on the left and the flower cover on the bottom. So as the diversity of flower, sorry, we'll start the other way. As the flower cover increases, then the diversity of the flower fly in, in turn results in a, an association there. And this was significant through stats. So this tells us that um, the more flower cover you have, the better it is for the flower fly community. So um, I wanted to show a bit more about what we're going to do this year. So something we're trying is a, a mycorrhizal trial. So when we go out and we do restoration of these sites, we're going to try using a mycorrhiza amendment. So a mycorrhiza just means fungi. So there is a natural uh, community of fungus species that are found in the ground. Uh, some that are benefits, some that are not. So we're using a product called Microbloom, which is uh, got a really good, healthy uh, diversity of, of mycorrhiza species. And so we're adding these to a couple of plots and we're gonna have a control plot and a treatment plot. And we're gonna compare the two sides and we'll use the scorecard again. And we're trying to uh, evaluate, as you see the hypothesis, that the treatment side will be showing less weeds and greater germination of native desirable species. So early on in a restoration project, you often get the pioneer species coming up first and it takes a longer period of time. Sometimes you never see the, um, what we call it conservative species that take longer and sometimes are very fussy about site conditions. So we're gonna see if this kind of helps along that trajectory and gets us there a little faster. And we did do a, a mycorrhiza webinar in January. So you can look for that too, if you wanna find out more about uh, mycorrhiza. So next steps, we're still continually looking at how you could improve quality on these sites. So um, we'll go into our mycorrhiza trials. We'll also continue our third year monitoring of the different treatment approaches. And something we're gonna do in some sites that we have that have low weed pressure, have more open or bare soils, we're going to try to add some butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed uh, in, in a few spots and see if we can diversify the milkweed community for the monarch and for other pollinators. We're also going to try and understand the effect of adjacent land use. So we think there's something happening with whether it's a woodland that's associated uh, right next to it, or if there's an agricultural field, how does that affect um, the quality? How does it affect the weeds? How does it affect the, the milkweed that's present? It can also probably really affect the pollinator communities and the species that were found in those areas. So that's the end of my presentation. And I wanted to thank all of our partners, so Lanark County, City of Ottawa, Leeds and Granville for partnering and supporting our program. And then our uh, funder here, Ontario Trillium Foundation. And then we can open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Tracy. This is a fantastic follow-up to have to the presentation that you gave us last year on the 2021 results. Um, and it's so wonderful um, to, to have these new updates and uh, for you to be doing this work for us to learn from. So um, like Tracy said, we're going to open this up for questions. If you prefer to ask your uh, question out loud, you can raise your hand and we can give you the opportunity to, to speak as well. So feel free to do that. Um, you can use the question answer function. And I also see some in the chat already. So I'm going to start there. Um, we have one question that is all about site prep. So in a situation where there's an invasive species that's already in um, a rights of way area, what advice can you give about um, preparing that area uh, to eradicate the species? So an example um, that was given was, uh, let's see here, uh, was to eradicate smooth brome, for example. Um, they're asking if mycorrhiza is a good way to do that. What are your thoughts? So generally, herbicide is the best way to do site prep. Like you really need to get rid of those uh, invasive plants. There's no point in putting seed into a site that's already uh, infested with weeds, whether on the surface or if there's a huge amount of seeds in the seed bank. So uh, 
those ones you really want to spray and watch and see over time how they can change, see if you can reduce the load of those. Uh, and then at the point where you feel like the weed pressure is under control, then is the time to do some seeding and then get the native plant community working for you to try to keep those uh, weeds at bay. Brome is a tricky one because it likes moisture and it likes that shading. So it grows in and it shades the soil and it takes over. So even if there's other ways you can reduce that uh, pressure with mowing, um, getting light in there, it uh, will help get rid of it and um, allow other species to take over. And then as far as mycorrhiza goes, we're, we're thinking that it probably will control weeds. So the research that's out there suggests that it does keep weeds under control. Um, it depends on a lot of things, of course, of like what species you have in your mycorrhiza powder, what your habitat type is, uh, what part of the world you are, which species that you're dealing with. So that's partly why we're trialing it this year to get a sense of if there is a benefit because it does cost some money and it is a little bit of extra effort to put it into a site. It may not be practical in, in huge sites. So we're keeping an eye on that. I will also uh, be sure to link the um, recording for our last webinar on the benefits of mycorrhiza and restoration um, in the email where this recording will go up to. So if you haven't been able to, to see that and would like to learn more about mycorrhiza, you can reference that webinar. Um, so let's see here. Next question. Um, are there any recommended seed mixes that uh, rights way managers can specify in construction contracts um, or if there are seed suppliers that will support these seed mixes? That's a great question. So what we've been working on over the last year is a seed mix calculator. So it's uh, for Ontario, so eastern and um, central areas of the province. And you find your ecoregion and there'll be a list of plants that are uh, recommended and it will help you create a seed mix and tell you like proportions that are recommended. You can also add species or remove certain species. And then at the end, it'll give you like volumes of how much, how many kilograms of certain seed. You can use that list to then send to a vendor and say, this is the seed mix I'm looking for. Um, you can also use it for cost estimates to get a sense of how much that seed mix is going to cost you. You may have to make choices about, you know, there is some seeds that are more expensive, so you might choose not to include those. Um, keeping in mind when you produce this list, we, we've identified that there's a big issue with seed in Canada and the availability of seed. Uh, we do have growers, but it's sparse, sparse across the country. Uh, some places have a lot of vendors, some have fewer, um, some species are really hard to grow. Um, so vendors are trying to keep up with demand and figure out what people really want. So keeping that in mind and being flexible with the vendors of your area, you know, things like local provenance are good. Um, if they grow their own seed, if it's sourced from a certain distance. Um, we also have a, a guide on our website to a PDF of how to pick a seed mix that would be helpful. But uh, it's, it's a big topic, but that's sort of some resources that you can look for. And I'm sure uh, Victoria will post the, the link to her seed mix calculator for people who are interested. For sure, I'll do that. We have a question also just asking for a copy of the scorecard. So I put a link in the chat. I'll also include that link. Um, it has for uh, all of the tiers. The, again, as a reminder, Tracy was sharing tier three um, and I'll put that in the email as well. We also just have a clarification question about your bar charts. Um, and if there's a being 3D, if there is a third access or is that just representing the, the line? Just 2D, yeah. Um, yes, the seed calculator will be included. Thank you for that question. Um, okay, so this question here, uh, their organization manages rights of way along roadsides and pathways. Um, they typically mow meadow habitats once annually late in the summer after the bird breeding season. What would be the ideal timing for mowing to improve the habitat for pollinators? Um, and should mowing uh, meadows be to a certain height? Good question. So we also have a mowing map that we produced. Um, it's more focused on monarchs, but it's looking at the different latitudes of Canada and when would be good times to mow to avoid impacts to monarchs. Um, 
that's a hard one to say across the board for all different pollinators. Um, that was something that, you know, you're looking at a whole community that it'd be hard to figure out when the best time to avoid them would be. But I like the idea of like a once a year mow in, in late fall, because then you're uh, letting the pollinators do most of their breeding and collecting during that year. Um, you might also want to know when monarchs are in your area, if they are, um, and when you could avoid damage to them breeding on that area. And the second question was about height. Um, I don't know, I know of any specific research on height. Um, you know, the, the higher you can mow would be better because then you're going to allow those plants a chance to regrow. You're also going to shade the ground more. So you're keeping moisture in the soil and keeping um, the nutrients in the soil. So I would say the highest might, height you can do with your mowers would be the best and still preserve safety issues, right? And also another uh, clarification question. I know that Tracy, you're focused more on the plant side of the surveying, but um, do you know if there is any specific methodology or protocol used for the pollinator species? So not for rights of way. I mean, there is a lot of protocols for pollinator collections in general, which is why we wanted to pair them in with this project uh, to figure out if this would be a, an approach that would be um, appropriate. So other people are, are doing, you know, net trapping or collections in different ways. So this is the first example we know of that's linking together the scorecard with the pollinators. But that's something that we would like to do more research on. And a um, question about the mycorrhiza trials. Did you and would you in the future apply the mycorrhiza um, to the surface or does it need to be incorporated into the soil? It's best if it's in the ground covered by soil and best if it's associated with the seed itself. So like you wouldn't want to just spread the mycorrhiza and then the seed separately. Like you saw in the picture, we pre-mixed the seed and the mycorrhiza together. The idea is you want to have that mycorrhiza close to the root of those plants when they're germinating because that's when it's going to be the benefit to get them started. Um, yeah, and they also, if you think about fungus, like they're prone to being dried out. So having them just on the surface of the soil is going to cause more erosion and more drying out. So yeah, you really want to get it down where it's a little bit more moist and protected in the soil. And you can also, some people grow like seedlings, if you, instead of using seed, if you wanted to buy plugs, you could incorporate the mycorrhiza powder right into the soil of that plug, and that gives it an extra boost as well. Uh, this is also going back to looking at the pollinator species. Is there um, potential for increasing the number of pollinator categories, for example, for bees? Um, they're recommending easy to use resources for like uh, bee identification or the um, more straightforward groups to identify like large carpenter bees or bumblebees. Mm -hmm. So the scorecard itself doesn't have any uh, any questions about pollinators other than you saw that little box that said you know, while you were there, did you happen to see bumblebees or did you see monarchs? Um, so that's designed for someone with no pollinator knowledge. Um, the way Gilles does his sampling, he's not specifically looking at groups, like he has a whole lot more data in terms of the diversity that he saw across the landscape. So um, yeah, that's as much as I could answer on that question. And uh, you mentioned adjacent lands affecting meadow habitat. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about which adjacent habitats would likely make meadows more suitable um, just to help in the selection of restoration for sites? Right, so what I have observed is that uh, the milkweed prefer open sunny areas and they seem to be more prevalent in areas adjacent to agricultural fields. So what I think is happening is probably a combination of there's more fertilizer in the ground. So it's stimulating those roots of the milkweed. Um, also, they tend to be more uh, drier sites. So milkweed does like to have uh, a little bit more on the drier side versus the wet side, at least for common milkweed. Um, swamp milkweed likes more damp and more wet. Um, and then the shadier sites, we tend to see less milkweed, but on the flip side, we tend to see more greater diversity of flowers. So I think what's happening is you have some of the plants creeping in from the woodland or woodland edge, 
And then um, you have its cooler temperatures, the soil is moister, so it can support a wider range of plants. And then you also are going to have pollinators that like that sort of woodland edge, like being in the woods, and then they're going to come out sort of to that edge and use those flower resources at the same time. So, you know, that's that's hypothesis and based on what we're, we think we're seeing in the field, we haven't proven that yet. And it's also going to depend on what your particular priority is. Is it for pollinators in general, or are you really focused on monarchs? Uh, maybe you want both, so you're going to make sure you have diversity of different sites. And um, someone in the chat is also wondering if our rights of way program also um, makes recommendations for restoration along multi-use pathways and trails, um, or also uh, railway. Um, they uh, were sad to see that there was um, a lot of mowing, mowing down milkweed in their area, along those mm -hmm. areas. So we haven't gotten into railways at all yet. Um, trails, we're starting to do some restoration in our Southwest project on trails. Uh, I think that those could be really great sites to do pollinator meadows in. Um, they're going to obviously be linear and, and narrow little stretches. But again, it would be like a, a woodland situation where you might would have additional side resources of trees and shrubs that are always good for the pollinators. Um, yeah, and provided you have low mowing and low spraying, then those could be really great. And you wouldn't have the issue of safety like on a road where you have to have certain sight lines for safety. You could have a lot of a narrower uh, width that you have to be concerned about. So, yeah. And for safety, something to keep in mind with multi-use pathways, if you have um, specifically people walking or people walking their dogs is ticks. Um, so just in including a safe spot for people to walk or, or some signage as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Um, we have a question about controlling Phragmites. Uh, do you have to use Roundup to do to control Phragmites or do you have any recommendations? So we didn't uh, have any Phragmites on some of these sites, but um, I know that there's a lot of trials where they're working with that uh, on the 400, 401. Um, and there's a, a chemical they're trying out now called uh, Aquatare, which is I think a newly released chemical. Um, and I think they do aerial spraying for that mostly. So I know they're trialing that out right now and trying to see how effective that is. But uh, Phragmites is definitely a challenging one. I did read the other day that big blue stem is a species that if you could get it seeded, it will at least hold back uh, Phragmites. But big blue stem likes drier sites. So you kind of have to uh, look at your site conditions to figure out what's gonna work. And our next question is very timely for you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> is there any way to modify the scorecard to consider the ecological benefits? So they're thinking about asters and goldenrod um, not earning a late fall site uh, or not giving um, a good score for a mm -hmm. late fall site. Yeah, which uh, is very, very good astute question. <laughs> so we, we do have a follow up meeting with the, the rights of way group and they're going to be talking to all the users of the scorecard, which, you know, goes all across the United States and in Canada. Um, you know, regional differences can be wide, like some places in um, the Corn Belt in the US, there's like no milkweed to be found. Where, where we are in central Ontario, we do have milkweed. We don't have an abundance, huge amounts of it, but we do have it. So, you know, is it fair for us to use that category? If we find 20 milkweeds, we get like the highest score for milkweed. Maybe that's not really appropriate. And then, as you mentioned, the aster and goldenrod, I think that there could be some edits that they could make towards evaluating. Maybe it's a full, full add-on that they do where you evaluate the asters and goldenrods and give that a score. You know, maybe that's less important if you're a place um, that doesn't have a lot of fall flowers. So it's uh, something they're going to have to figure out. Uh, we'll probably make our, our own changes going forward, but I think it's still important to get out and evaluate the species that you're seeing in the fall. And um, has solarization of non-desirable plants, for example, smooth brome, has that been trialed yet? Or um, do you know of any uh, cases where that has been trialed? 
Uh, I know that they have used that in a few places. Uh, I'm a, not an expert on Phragmites, but if you look up your local uh, invasive species council of whatever province you're in, they have uh, recommended um, protocols for that. I know here in Ontario, the Ontario Invasive Species Council has a whole working group on Phragmites trying to figure out the best way. Um, a lot of big projects up in Georgian Bay where they're trying to get it under control. So I would encourage you to look for some of those sources. And we have lots of questions. This is fantastic. <laughs> Good. We left lots of chime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have another question about um, whether we do workshops for teachers in nature scaping their school grounds with their students. Mm -hmm. um, so for that question, I would actually encourage you to take a look at our Canadian Wildlife Federation webpage um, that is focused on, it's called Wild Spaces. It's a program um, uh, through our education department where they work with uh, teachers and students um, to learn more about pollinators and um, pollinator habitat. So I'll also include a link to that in the email as well. Um, I don't know, Tracy, if you have anything else for that. But... Um, no, just that there's a lot of great resources out there for pollinators and schoolyards and naturalization. So um, do some Googling and I'm sure you'll find some great resources. And um... Someone is also just commenting that a once a year mow in late fall, as suggested, also helps reduce the fire risk if you remove the biomass, which is important if you're near any communities. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, others are are just also confirming that smooth brome is a is a big issue in their areas. Um, do you have any advice on how to manage road size cost effectively to meet objectives of both preventing tree growth conflicts with hydro utilities, but also preserving sightline clearances to prevent accidents while enhancing pollinator habitat? Um, <laughs> they're, they're needing some, some tools to, to convince uh, municipalities of, of doing this. Mm -hmm. So one of our um, rock stars in this, this world is Lanark County. So uh, I'm sure Victoria could link you back to one of the previous webinars we've done with Lanark. So they, you know, everyone we encourage to keep your sight lines, right? Whatever the ministry regulation is about what amount you have to clear. I think it's like one to two meters of width. Uh, that's still important to keep that. And we're not encouraging people to plant in that area, um, both for safety, but also because any kind of contaminates uh, in the soil, salts or nutrients, um, are going to be mostly concentrated in that first area. And then as you move out, there's going to be less concentrations of those, which, you know, could be uptaken into plants. So we're suggesting that you look at your setback from your safety zone and what areas that you can uh, do work in there. Uh, as far as the benefits, or I should say the economic aspects of it, um, obviously reduced mowing is a, a cost or a savings. Um, you can also look at the carbon emissions of reducing your mowing. Uh, obviously the herbicides do have impact, so you're looking at ecosystem benefit there. Uh, the U.S. Rights of Way group is actually working on a, an economic review study right now to look for case studies of different examples of um, places that have done these kinds of projects and to see what their, their economic gain was on it. Uh, Lanark did see like a uh, savings over time. They had to mow less and less. Um, you know, probably what's happening is the native species are coming in, holding that space, uh, making it a little easier to manage some of those invaders that like a monoculture. We have a few more questions um, and just so many great comments. I, I see that there are so many people on this call today who are working um, it seems like often with municipalities to to restore some areas and I'm really happy to see that and um, I might even get in touch with you to learn more. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your, your comments. Um, so this one is asking if we have any plans to expand our restoration projects they're particularly interested in any work that's taking place in southwestern Ontario. Mm -hmm. So we definitely, we have a Southwest Rights of Way network. So anyone who's working on Rights of Way can join, can learn. Uh, we offer training opportunities. And then we also have been funding some restoration sites in Southwestern Ontario. So meadow sites, um, we know that 
monarch travel through southwestern Ontario. They hit Point Pelee and they cross the lake. So um, that's sort of our focus is trying to get nectar and pollen habitat resources on the ground there. So um, I'm definitely sure Victoria can connect you with our, our rights of way group for the southwest. And I also wanted to mention we do have a, a rights of way habitat guide on our website as well, which has lots of good advice on how to do some of these projects. You'll find in the email that I send out is going to have a lot of resources for you. <laughs> so if there's any that have been shared in the in the chat that you didn't get uh, the chance to, to copy the link for, I'll be sure to include those in that email. Um, we have another great question here that's asking about reseeding meadows versus main thoroughfare highways. Is there a preference? And also asking about um, mortality rate of monarchs along highways compared to meadows or private property. Hmm. So mortality is something we get asked a lot about. Um, the research out there, uh, from what we can gather, is saying that, yes, there could be mortality for pollinators crossing the road. We don't know how much of a, a proportion, like is that a big proportion or not. Uh, we just tend to focus on best management practices. So if you were doing these restoration projects, it's best to focus on low volume or low speed roads so that um, monarchs have more of a chance to get across the road. Um, without being hit and also to avoid seeding medians like a lot of highways will have a grassy median in the middle and if you were to put a pollinator mix in that you could be encouraging them to double cross the highway and then you have an increased risk of uh, mortality but I mean in the general overall sense like the more flower resources the more we're going to support pollinators so um, anything we can do is benefiting the pollinators in the big big scheme of things. And then could you repeat the, the first question? Yes, yeah, who is asking about reseeding meadows versus main thoroughfare highways? Is there a preference from one or the other? Okay, so I, I think that. I address that. So yeah, basically the, the slower roads would be better. Um, you know, meadows don't have to be in a roadside, like they could be trails, they could be uh, park spaces, conservation area lands, um, you know, schoolyards, all kinds of places are good habitat for, or good locations for meadow habitat. And that brings us to the end of the questions that I could see. I think I, I got to um, all of them. If there was one that we missed, we'll double check. Uh, oh, a follow-up question here. Um, is a 400, uh, 400 series highway, would that um, not be preferable um, as a as an area for restoration. Yeah, so again, we probably encourage them to do like one side of the road so that the pollinators, if, if there's enough resources, they'll travel linearly across that stand, that's um, swath of pollinator resources and they're not driven to cross the road. So yeah, one side of the road would be better in those kinds of scenarios. And then, you know, anywhere you can be back away from the road is a good choice too. Wonderful. Um, so if there's any questions that we didn't, you didn't get the chance to ask today, um, feel free to email us and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to point you in the right direction, uh, give you any resources that we may have. Thank you again, Tracy, for taking your time today to answer all of our, question, or answer our questions. Um, we had so much engagement. That was so wonderful and so wonderful to learn of all the, the great things others are working on today and a, a treat to have um, uh, people joining as rights of way managers and other land managers and those from the community who are just really interested in this work. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us today. It was wonderful to have you. Uh, stay tuned for um, an email with many, many resources and the recording of this, and we will um, see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>